Tonight's symposium is part of a special series that we inaugurated uh, last spring. This series is designed to give New York City community members engaged in justice-related fields the opportunity to learn about groundbreaking research being conducted by John Jay faculty. Today's topic is homegrown terrorism. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, which took the lives of 67 John Jay alumni and students, the college launched a number of initiatives intended to bring a better understanding of terrorism so as we hope to prevent it. In response to this threat, Dr. Joshua Freilich, Executive Officer of the Criminal Justice PhD program and a professor uh, in our criminal justice department, has partnered with the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, called START for short, to fill the gaps in research on domestic terrorism. Introducing our speaker tonight and moderating the Q&A session is Eugene O'Donnell, a faculty member in the Department of Law and Police Science. Professor O'Donnell served as a police officer with the New York Police Department, winning 14 department awards for outstanding police service in Brooklyn. He later became an assistant district attorney at the Queens Dis District Attorney's Office, and then served as a senior prosecutor and supervisory prosecutor at the Kings County District Attorney's Office. I bring to the podium and introduce to you Professor Jean O'Donnell. Thank you, uh, Provost Bowers, because you never know how popular you really are, but so I'll, uh, I'll leave that alone. And I'll be very brief. I think that's the job of a moderator. Uh, Josh has an absolutely uh, outstanding uh, background. He's an attorney as well as being a, uh, an academic. He runs the PhD program here at John Jay. Three degrees ago for him, that is to say, his JD, PhD, and MA ago, he was a, 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 a product of the City University of New York and Brooklyn College, so we always like to uh, welcome our own, our own to the podium. So, Professor Josh Freilich, director of our PhD program. I would like to begin uh, by thanking uh, the college uh, for inviting me uh, to speak to you uh, today. Um, so, the uh, talk tonight uh, is entitled uh, Terrorism and Ideological Offending in the United States. Uh, this research flows from, uh, my, um, from my own research, which is funded by uh, the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the START Terrorism Research Center, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a couple of moments. Uh, I just want to point out that any opinions that are expressed on my own and are not uh, the opinions of the government necessarily or of uh, START. Uh, in 2004, uh, the Department of Homeland Security initiated what is referred to as their Centers of Excellence program. START is one such center of excellence, and they are charged with studying social science and terrorism, the social and behavioral characteristics of both terrorism and counterterrorism. Um, but in addition to the research, START is also very much committed to uh, education and training, uh, mentoring of the next generation of Homeland Security practitioners as well as scholars. And therefore, in addition to the research that START produces, they do a lot in terms of curriculum, uh, classes on terrorism, but also in helping to place students, recent graduates of college, into the Homeland Security workforce, uh, working for police agencies, as well as getting students into a graduate school education. Uh, the United States Extremist Crime Database Study, which is a part of START, uh, we also share uh, this mission. Um, so besides the research that we conducted, uh, we work very closely with our students and try and train them in research, both in terms of doctoral level education, as well as those who want to work in the Homeland Security area. Our goal in creating uh, the ECDB was that until recently, uh, terrorism, uh, despite what you might think, had not been the subject of a lot of rigorous academic attention. Um, and this is particularly so when you looked at terrorism inside the United States, what is referred to as domestic terrorism. Now, one distinction that you'll sometimes hear about is between domestic and transnational terrorism. Uh, there's a little bit of debate about this, but in general, transnational terrorism is when citizens of country A attack country B. It's from one country to another. Domestic terrorism, a homegrown terrorism, is generally considered to be when citizens of country A attack country A. They attack their own country. Uh, so when we began uh, the ECDB in uh, 2005, uh, we wanted to focus on the leading threats to this country. 
And as you'll see tonight, the threat is actually multifaceted. It encompasses a wide variety of ideological groupings. And currently, we are funding to focus upon uh, three of the largest uh, threats today inside this country, which are supporters of Al-Qaeda and, rel and related extremist movements, far-right neo-Nazi militia and patriot movement groups in this country, as well as far leftists like animal rights and environmental rights extremists. Uh, so right now, we're focusing on their criminal activities in general, and particularly on their violent crimes and on their financial crimes. The goal, again, was to, uh, to be able to collect the information in such a way that we would have access to a large number of characteristics across what is referred to multiple units of analysis. Uh, but the goal was to be able to test theory, and by testing theory, hopefully to uncover significant patterns that would not just be of interest to academics, but as uh, Professor O'Donnell noted, might also be of great use to policymakers and practitioners and those charged with confronting domestic terrorism, those engaged in counterterrorism. So one question um, that I'm sure some of you might be wondering is, why the ECDB? I mean, there's other databases out there that focus on domestic terrorism. Why do we need another database? And what we argued to the Department of Homeland Security and to other funding agencies is that when you look at the information that was currently being collected, there was a significant omission in that certain types of information seemed to be systematically excluded. So the very first uh, uh, contribution of the United States Extremist Crime Database is that we do not limit ourselves to violent criminal acts. Almost every terrorism definition requires the act to be violent. If you were to leave tonight's talk and go to the FBI's definition, you would see that the FBI requires a terrorist act to include the use of force or violence. So any act that does not have force or violence does not meet the Federal Bureau of Investigation's definition of what is terrorism. Financial crimes, in almost every case, are not violent. Now, we're not arguing that financial crimes are terrorists. Of course they're not, if you want to use violence. But what we are saying is that political extremists commit a large, possibly commit a large amount of financial crimes that might be of interest to both an academic, but just as importantly, to a practitioner charged with confronting terrorism. Financial crimes could be used to support it financially, uh, we wondered whether there would be an escalation effect. Maybe people begin by financial crimes and they move on to more serious crimes. If you take a step back and you think about it, there might be all sorts of connections that could possibly exist between financial crimes and violent crimes. So one thing that we did is we did away with this restriction and we said we were going to also capture as best as we could uh, all of the financial crimes that are reported in the open sources committed by these types of extremists. Uh, the second major contribution is, again, uh, a significant one, and that almost every definition of terrorism requires the act to be political. Uh, that's the language that's used in the FBI's definition, a political or social objective. It needs to be ideologically motivated. But human beings are complex. Uh, human beings, uh, besides committing ideological crimes, might also commit personal crimes, jealousy, greed, etc. Again, nobody is claiming that non-ideological crimes are terrorism. But it would be of interest, we thought, to examine any possible patterns that might connect a non-ideological crime to an ideological crime. And in fact, as you'll see in a little bit, um, oftentimes ideologically motivated crimes are committed by extremists, but sometimes you have non-extremists who also participate in the crime. Um, so therefore, our project also includes these non-extremist collaborators. Uh, the FBI um, has, has a rule um, that for the most part, an act is not considered to be terrorism unless it's prosecuted on the federal level. By definition, you cannot have a state level case called terrorism according to the FBI. The American terrorism and other academic endeavors also employ this same rule. We again said this is a charging decision. It really has no impact upon the behavior. There might very well be behaviors that are ideologically motivated that we might want to pay attention to but for whatever reason are on the state level as opposed to the federal level. So we include those cases too. The fifth contribution is an interesting one. Um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation for a very long time and other domestic terrorism databases, uh, they had a rule that for the most part they followed. And that is acts were only considered to be terrorism if they were claimed by an organized ongoing entity. It had to be claimed by a group. In other words, acts that were committed by what's sometimes referred to as lone wolves or lone actors are normally not classified as terrorism. Again, we don't make this distinction. Uh, now, in fairness to the FBI, what they would argue is lone individuals don't have an infrastructure. They don't have logistics that an organized entity does. 
As we all know, in a time of austerity with budget cuts coming, you have to make choices. The FBI argued it's better to pay attention to organized threats that have an ongoing capacity. Uh, so here's our database. How do we actually make a decision case by case? What types of criminal activities get into the database and what types of criminal activities are excluded from the database? Uh, so we have a uh, um, inclusion criteria and our inclusion criteria are really two pronged in nature. There is a behavioral component and there is an attitudinal component. So a certain types of behavior needs to be committed and the individuals committing that behavior have to have a certain type of belief system for us to say, you, we want to focus upon you. You belong in the United States Extremist Crime Database Study. In terms of behavior, and we'll go into this a bit deeper in the next slide, we're focusing on illegal acts inside the United States. So there has to be an illegal crime internally. Um, it has to be violent or financial in nature. It needs to be public. We need to know about it. So it needs to be in an open source. And finally, hearsay is not enough. It can't be that there's a rumor Farlick committed a financial crime. We need some type of official action by the government. Um, and secondly, at the time of the criminal act, either violent or financial, at least one of the perpetrators had to be an extremist. Now again, if five people commit the act or commit the crime and three are extremists and two are not extremists, we code everybody because at least one person was an extremist. Uh, and then of course, we also focus on financial crimes. And I could spend a whole year talking about this, uh, I won't. My PhD student, Roberta Belli, actually spent pretty close to a year trying to figure out what I'm going to say uh, right now. And that is, uh, when you look at violent crimes and you want to count them, you have spatial and temporal distinctions that are pretty self-evident. You don't have that in financial crimes. Think about the Bernie Madoff case. This is a wide-ranging financial crime that involved a decade or more. It involved all 50 states and maybe overseas. How do you break that down into incidents? The answer is you can't. Um, so what we had to do, what Roberta did for her dissertation is she created a new unit of analysis called the financial scheme, which is an ongoing plot, let's say, a modus operandi that, is a, that occurs over a period of time that involves illegal behavior. The beautiful thing about a financial scheme from a um, methodological point of view is that it can be linked to perpetrators, business entities, and victims, and it can function the same way that an incident can. Okay. Um, so now that we know the types of crimes that we want to focus upon and what belongs in our database, how did we find them? Our first stage was to identify any possible violent or financial crime that could meet our definition. And to do this, I have down uh, 50 sources. It's really well over 100 now. We reviewed well over 100 distinct sources, and uh, we combed through them. And any violent or financial crime that we thought might meet our criteria, we pulled out and we put on a list. Um, we, we looked at five different types of sources, uh, existing terrorism databases, journalistic accounts, chronologies published by the Anti-Defamation League and other watch groups, and also official sources. And the second stage, each criminal incident is treated as a case study. It's assigned to a research assistant. Normally, this is an undergraduate student. And their goal is to systematically look through open sources and to uncover all publicly available information on that event, the perpetrators who committed it, and those who might have been victims of the crime. Uh, the information that's uncovered, um, we're actually pleasantly pleased with. Of course, it varies by case, but quite often we get quite a bit of information on each individual case. 80% of the information that we use comes from the media, but 20% does not. It comes from court documents, uh, gov other government documents, materials from the movement, etc. Now, sometimes when you have all these different sources, you might have a conflict. Suffice it to say, similar to other researchers, we argue that information that has been part of the adversarial system where an oath is taken and there's a back and forth between attorneys in a courtroom is considered to have a higher standard of reliability than a personal opinion published, let's say, in an op-ed or a web page, where there's no oath and there's no adversarial back and forth. Um, so now we have all of this information. What have we learned? Um, first lesson is, is the need to disaggregate terrorism. If you look at far-right terrorists, to left-wing terrorists, to supporters of al-Qaeda, you will notice they look very, very different and they might be involved in very, very different criminal activities. So let's just look at some of the distinctions that we've uncovered. Animal and environmental rights extremists have committed very few homicides in the last 22 years. However, the far right and Al-Qaeda, and we'll talk about this in a second, have been much more active in terms of fatal incidents. So if your interest is preventing incidents where people are at risk of being killed, there is a difference. Eco and animal rights extremists are not your greatest threat in that regard. 
It's coming from the far right and supporters of Al-Qaeda. Uh, what's important, though, is you have different temporal and spatial patterns. So where these attacks occur are not in the same place. So you don't have the same states that have far-right attacks being more likely to have Al-Qaeda attacks or animal rights attacks. So again, there is a need to disaggregate depending upon what you want to counter. So too, their patterns over time are not the same. But also very interesting is you have differences in terms of demographics. Far-right terrorists tend to be older than left-wing terrorists and supporters of Al-Qaeda. Um, they tend to live in rural areas. They tend to be more religious. Um, and very interestingly, they tend to be underemployed and to have lower education levels. This is actually a fascinating point. It's quite common among terrorism researchers to say, despite what the public thinks, terrorists are not less well-educated or more impoverished than, than uh, other extremists or the general population. There's been a lot of studies done on this in the Middle East and in Asia, where people have compared the characteristics of terrorists to the general population. And in general, terrorists are not poorer, they're not less well-educated, there's very few differences. The far right looks very different. Over 40% of these perpetrators were unemployed at the time they committed the, the homicide. That is obviously much larger than Al-Qaeda supporting extremists, eco-extremists, and of course the general population. Um, looking at, at county level analysis, if you go to the perpetrators of those far right homicides, uh, which is what we did, at the time the homicide was committed, we wanted to know which county did the perpetrator live in. What is different about those counties that had far, far right perpetrators and those that did not? And what we found is, is that some of the concepts that are consistent with a social disorganization framework also work in seeming to explain why some of these, far, why some of these counties had far right perpetrators. The takeaway from this is, is that a theory that was designed to explain regular crime might have use for political crime, political violence. Um, our second lesson learned is that when you look at the crimes committed by political extremists in this country, Many of them do not meet the Federal Bureau of Investigation's uh, definition or um, criteria or many other terrorism databases. Uh, when you look at the far-right homicide perpetrators, 80% of these guys were tried on the state level. These were not federal prosecutions. So these are cases that are not going, into the, they're not going to be in the FBI's numbers. But very interesting is 35% of the far-right perpetrators and around half of the Al-Qaeda supporters were lone actors. These are individuals, they did the attack on their own. They didn't belong to a group, the, the so-called lone wolf. And finally, um, a lot of attention on financial crimes in, in terms of what we've uncovered. We've identified over 700 financial schemes committed by far-right extremists and supporters of Al-Qaeda and groups like Hamas and Hezbollah in this country since 1990. Well over $700 million in damage. It's actually a gross estimate, the 700 million. Um, different ideological groupings are doing different types of financial crimes. Far-right financial crimes tend to be tax avoidance. A lot of them mixed motives, both anti-government and greed. Al-Qaeda uh, and, and supporters of Al-Qaeda committing material support and money laundering. But here, too, a number of these schemes also involving greed, so not purely ideology. But very interesting is close to 500 perpetrators committed these financial crimes, and when you look at the breakdown, only 270 are extremists. 215 are not extremists. So these are non-extremists who are committing crime with extremists, often in furtherance of a political goal, but they themselves do not share the political goal. So why would they do it? Well, in a lot of cases, it's greed. And sometimes they were sought out by the extremists because they possessed a unique skill, maybe an accountant, to help launder money. Again, it goes back to our original point that people are complex and they bring multiple motives to the very same illegal endeavor. And that while a lot of people focus on the political aspect, being a criminologist, we're much more focused on the behavior. And I think many in law enforcement would agree. So third lesson learned um, is the need, if you're interested in causality, to have proper comparison groups. But if you really want to get at causality, you need to explain what is different about those where you see violence to those situations where you don't see violence. And you can do this in a number of ways. Let's say you're interested in seaports. You can look at seaports that were attacked, but if you want to get a causality, you got to do a case control method where you have to take similar seaports that weren't attacked and then compare across to see what the difference is in terms of why one was more likely to be attacked. So too, on the individual level, it would be useful to have two supporters of Al-Qaeda, two neo-Nazis, one to be violent, one to be nonviolent, and then to make comparisons across what differentiates the violent? 
And you can do this for organizations, violent groups to nonviolent groups, and that's what we did. And then we used statistical analyses and we identified factors that seem to distinguish the violent from the nonviolent groups. So older groups and groups that were larger were more likely to be violent. This, kind, this seems to be self-evident. Older groups, you're around for a longer period of time. You have the ability to learn and to adapt. You can gain skills. It might provide a greater capacity to commit violence. So too, larger groups, greater opportunity. You just need one person to commit an act to be violent, so more an opportunity to be violent. Also larger groups, people from different backgrounds, more likely to be influenced from others. Again, possibility for more violent. But there were also some less expected findings that seemed to be particularly intriguing. One was groups that published literature, that publicized their ideas, they gave out pamphlets, they rallied, they were less likely to be violent. And here our thinking was is that these were groups that might have been focused on recruitment. They wanted others to join the cause. Therefore, what we were thinking is they stayed away from violence because obviously violence would garner more attention from the police, possibly scare away recruits. But again, from a law enforcement point of view, if you have a group that's in your area and they're very much involved in publicizing their ideas, as reprehensible as that might be, those ideas to the general population, our research suggests these may not be the groups that you want to worry about. That in fact, it might be the groups that you don't know about that, that pose a greater danger. We also found that groups with charismatic leaders and groups that advocated leaderless resistance are more likely to be violent. Now, this is actually an important point. Um, leaderless resistance refers to the following. It's when leaders of a group say, we are under scrutiny by the government. Therefore, we cannot get involved in an organized campaign against the government. Um, some people might have argued, this is just talk. It doesn't mean anything. We demonstrated empirically that groups who called for leaderless resistance, their members were, in fact, more likely to be involved in violence. Again, we would argue very useful from a law enforcement point of view. But we also focus not just on the event, but on perpetrators and victims. Particularly, victims tend to be ignored. If you go back to many terrorism definitions, part of the definition, many times, is the phrase, a random attack. So some scholars have said, we don't have to study victims because they're a random part of the population. It's a random distribution. That always bothered us. Uh, one interesting finding is, is that when you look at the vic who the victims are, you do find patterns. If you look at all homicides in this country, who the victims are, well less than 1%, maybe one-tenth of 1% are members of law enforcement. If you look at who the far right kills, close to 10% of victims are members of law enforcement killed in the line of duty or criminal justice personnel. That is a very key difference. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about when you, what, well, what we see when you look at homicides directed at law enforcement victims. Just a couple of interesting findings. Who is charged with preventing domestic terrorism? Federal Bureau of Investigation, federal agents. Who is least likely to be killed by far-right extremists? Federal agents. Who is the most likely to be killed? State and local, particularly local law enforcement officers. So there's a disconnect. What we're finding with attacks against police officers, these attacks are ideologically motivated in some cases, but when the perpetrator woke up, they weren't planning to kill the police. Instead, they get involved in seemingly mundane situations, as uh, being pulled over by a traffic stop, a home visit. And these, uh, these situations escalate. You're anti-government, you don't like the police, you think, they're part of the, you think they're part of the tyrannical government, and now here's a police officer in your face, and you believe taking, you know, infringing upon your rights. The incident escalates, Death occurs. Death, unfortunately, occurs. Uh, so we're very excited about what the future holds in terms of being able to test theory, uh, which would be of interest to academics. Publishing, of course. We always love publishing. Uh, but also some of the findings uh, for law enforcement and practitioners uh, are having this information uh, be useful to those on the ground. We're always working with DHS to give talks to law enforcement, do trainings of analysts, webinars on the phone, or visiting fusion centers, uh, trying to crystallize our findings into briefs that can be circulated, just trying to, as best we can, contribute in some way to the uh, security uh, of our nation. Uh, so I'll end it here. I just want to thank uh, again uh, you for taking all of you for taking the time to uh, listen, uh, thanking Jane Bowers and uh, moderator O'Donnell for their very gracious remarks, and uh, those who helped put it together. So thank you so much. I'm going to ask him a question, which I'm sure he's going to recoil at as a, as a researcher, but probably some of you guys would ask it, which is the predictive value of, this, of any of this work. Does it have the value to predict going forward um, any particular or general 
um, threats or issues? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're always very wary of making predictions uh, for the future. Uh, what we do is we study behaviors in the past to uncover patterns. And uh, some of those patterns we think might very well be useful in making funding allocations or personnel allocations. Um, but even in terms of prediction, uh, one finding which I might not have mentioned before is, and we see this with our own data and other projects, is terrorism threats are not static. So if you were to look at the 1990s or the 1980s, who is perceived to be the greatest threat, they're different. Uh, we actually surveyed uh, the state police agencies a couple of years ago. We asked them to rank threats. Biggest threats were the far right, animal rights extremists, and of course supporters of Al Qaeda. The 18th threat was left-wing revolutionaries supportive of the old Soviet Union. You look at surveys of law enforcement in the 1990s, they're the second to third threat right after the far right. Then uh, Middle Eastern and support terrorists and supporters of Al Qaeda are very, very low down. So I think it's useful to try and look for patterns to prevent uh, future acts. But I think it's also important, just as you just said, that this is a moving target, that the threat evolves over time and changes over time. So you always need to be aware of that. Sir, our first question of the evening. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Again, if I understood you right, the, the three categories that you're breaking your incidents down into far right, um, eco, ALF, and then the third one, uh, which I think you're calling al-Qaeda and related, uh, you, you seem to have included Hamas and Hezbollah fundraising under that category. Um, would you not say that um, you're lumping together some very different ideologies and groups there? And, and would that not um, yeah. change the picture if you un unpack that? Thank yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so two-part question. Uh, you're right, we don't have a general uh, description of extremism. Because we're focusing on specific ideologies or specific segments, uh, we operationalize each of them separately. But I do think there's a commonality across, uh, which would be conspiracy theories. Uh, in many cases, the blaming of the government uh, with the far right or American society in the case of supporters of Al-Qaeda um, for their actions, and therefore civilians, non-governmental entities being legitimate targets. Um, and with the cases of ECO, that would be private corporations. Uh, so that, I would think, would be that commonality across the movements. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Hey, uh, great presentation. This is going back to the confrontations between police and right-wing extremists. Um, for the kind of spontaneous ones, do you, um, how do you code any of these that, are, that result in the um, extremist death as opposed to the police officer? Like, do you the, include those? And if so, how are they coded? That's a great question. Um, so we do. So a lot of times when perpetrators are killed, the, uh, um, a police officer was killed too. So you have the fatality of, of the uh, police officer, so it comes in. And then we'll also note that the perpetrator was killed at the scene. But you're right. Um, we were very much aware that because of the unique ideology of the far right, they might very well be involved in run-ins where thankfully law enforcement was not killed. Maybe they were just wounded or they missed, but other officers then killed the perpetrator. And uh, we, inclu we include those incidents. So we include incidents that turned violent. No police was killed, but the perpetrator was killed. We have around 17 incidents like that where um, they, they are violent incidents. Perpetrators were killed. They engaged in violence against law enforcement, but no police officer was killed. So we, we do have information on those events, too. OK, and the second question is, do you have plans to take this further back um, in time using resources like the GTD or just regular open source? Uh, great question. Uh, Should you get the funding? <laughs> uh, originally, we did. Um, we, for a long time, we had wanted to go back to 1980 and 1970. Um, that didn't work out, even though there was interest from the government. But I have to say, I think in retrospect, probably not. Uh, and this is a bit crude, what I'm going to say, but my sense is, is when you look at newspapers, um, 1990, around that time, seems to be a bit of a cutoff. You have a lot more stuff available electronically um, as opposed to before 1990. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Freilich. Thank you. Thank you.